Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Axel Kleinsmith from uh, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, Potsdam. Uh, he's going to talk about generating series for closed string scattering at genus one. And this is basically the uh, uh, 13th, probably 13th QASTM talk. And uh, uh, I have to say thank you to Professor Klein Smith for uh, agreeing to give a uh, uh, general talk in this forum. And he actually uh, will talk about few of his works in this uh, talk. So it is not a very technical talk or very pedagogical talk. So he will uh, try to cover the whole spectrum. So uh, thank you, Axel, for giving uh, this talk and uh, hope we will enjoy uh, and learn from you. And you can start. Thank you very much. Uh... And thank you for asking me to give this talk as well. Um, I realized during the introduction, I mean, you did say I should give a pedagogical talk and I'm trying, but I will also have some technical aspects that I yeah, will cover. So that's why I said the mixture. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's too late to change the slides. So, but certainly there will be, I'm, I'm going to try to be pedagogical, certainly in the beginning. And um, as you said already, this is covering several works of mine with different collaborators. So uh, most of the uh, things I will talk about are actually in papers with Jan Gerken and Oliver Schlotterer. So Jan Gerken is also here at the uh, Institute in Potsdam at the Albert Einstein Institute and Oliver Schlotterer is now at the University of Uppsala. You can see the references there. And if I have time, I will also mention some work with Daniele Dorigoni from Durham and uh, Olaf Alain, who was a student here in Potsdam. So, oops. Okay, so the, uh, let me start maybe by saying what the big picture is, so what this talk will be about. So I will discuss um, aspects of string perturbation theory. And I think many of the people in the audience will have had a course on string theory or heard about string theory and know that string perturbation theory is about an expansion in Riemann surfaces or are sometimes also called the world sheet genus expansion. So here I've drawn, uh, this would be like a tree level diagram. There is no hole in the surface, one hole, two holes and so on. So the number of holes for a closed string is what is called the genus of the Riemann surface. And um, this is an interesting topic to study. It was at the very beginning of string theory. And of course, uh, the reason why this is interesting to study is because scattering amplitudes are really, whenever you talk about a physical model, these are the most fundamental things you want to know because they describe what are the states of the theory and how do these states interact. And if we want to describe what is going on around us, we want to know something about interactions. So this is uh, clearly one thing why, I mean, for any physical theory, you want to study scattering amplitudes. In the context of string theory, there is another motivation, which is string theory is claimed to be a theory of quantum gravity. So there is certainly something where string theory modifies what you would compute in gravity. And as I'm sure most of you will know, in gravity, perturb perturbation theory is very ill-defined. It's not a renormalizable theory. Uh, in the standard sense, and so string theory, if it lives up to this claim, should modify the scattering amplitudes of gravity, and this is something that you can learn by studying the scattering amplitudes of string theory. So you might also learn I some... just have one yeah. question. So you have mentioned that uh, show how string theory modifies gravity. Can you speak a little bit more on that? I will come, yeah, so this is really just uh, first describing the very big picture. So certainly string theory will modify gravity and uh, later on I will show you very explicit expressions for uh, what a scattering amplitude looks like in string theory and also how it modifies the gravity scattering amplitude. Okay, okay, sure. So the, yeah? Yeah. Um, I mean, the basic idea is that of course gravity you think of as a, a low energy effective action, let's say the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is a two derivative action. You think of this as being an effective description at low energies, but as you increase the energy, um, you can excite other states uh, in string theory that are not present in usual gravity. And this will have an effect on the scattering amplitudes. But I will make this much more precise when I give you the explicit formulas. Okay, sure. Um, 
yeah, besides these corrections to gravity, there uh, is also the chance to learn something about string theory itself. And as will hopefully also become clear, this topic that I will discuss in this talk will also have uh, very interesting connections to things going on in mathematics uh, related to number theory and uh, things like that. So I will also hope to touch on that. The, um, uh, this talk, I mean, will mainly focus on a review on some things that are known. And as I said, mainly the new work done together with Jan Gerken and Oliver Schlatterer. And here's the plan of what I'm hoping to cover. So uh, I will start with a sort of very heuristic, but uh, semi-precise reminder of what string scattering means. What are the things that go into computing a string scattering amplitude? Uh, what are the techniques? And then, uh, so this will be a very, fairly general discussion where I also come back to your question related to um, how string theory modifies gravity. And then I will move on and uh, discuss in much more detail the recent work. I mean, this I will give references. It's not something that we develop related to genus one scattering amplitudes and to something that will become clear what I mean by this called modular graph forms. And these modular graph forms are very closely related to string scattering amplitudes at genus one. So that means one loop order. And um, they're interesting objects, but it's not so easy to deal with them. So much of our work was concerned with finding an organizing principle for these modular graph forms and uh, how to organize them in a generating series and how you can use this generating series to go back and learn something about uh, string scattering amplitudes. So this is uh, the rough plan of the talk. And uh, please uh, continue to interrupt me whenever you have a question. Okay, so uh, some basic things about string perturbation theory or string scattering methods. This picture I showed you before, but now the question is how do you turn this picture, which looks very intuitive. So you have, let's say four strings here and they interact through the shape of some string world sheet either without a hole or with one hole, so genus one or two holes and so on. How do you turn this kind of picture into a mathematical formula? And of course, what I'm reviewing here is a standard textbook material, um, but I'm reviewing it nevertheless to set the scene a bit. So uh, here is a collection of some textbooks on string theory where you might want to look up more details about what I'm saying. So, the first thing that you need is you need to have an action that describes the uh, string theory. And the standard action that I will take here is the string, uh, the Polyakov action. So the P is for Polyakov. And let me unpack a bit of, uh, for you what the different things here are. So it's an integral over something that I will call sigma throughout the talk. And this is the world sheet. So this is what is drawn here as a two-dimensional surface. So you integrate over a two-dimensional surface called the world sheet. This uh, surface comes with a certain metric called gamma AB. There's a determinant here as usual for diffeomorphism invariants. And then you have fields living on that two dimensional world sheet that are called X. And uh, this is a kinetic term for these fields X. And uh, you have a number of different fields which are related to the fact that you think of these fields X living on the world sheet sigma as being maps from sigma into some space M called the target space or the background space of the string theory. So um, in the simplest case that I will consider, I will take this target space M here to be nothing but just d-dimensional Minkowski space. So these are maps now from the world sheet into d-dimensional Minkowski space. Uh, there are d of them labeled X mu and I contract the indices using the, using the background metric on M. So this is in some sense the simplest instance that you could consider, namely a string moving in a flat background. You can generalize this much more and this goes under the name of string sigma models. Now, um, something that is also important, you want the action to be dimensionless. This is a two dimensional integral. So in order to have something dimensionless, you want to divide uh, by a length squared, which is here given as one over alpha primed and alpha primed is often also written in terms of the string length. So this is like the fundamental length scale of a string of a one dimensional extended object squared. So except here, yeah. this AB indices kind of a like internal 
indices? Yes, so, so these A, B indices, these are indices uh, that go from one to two. So these are the indices on this two-dimensional world sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have maps. So this in some sense, normally when you think of Q of T, you think of something that lives in space-time, but here actually you're dealing with a field theory on a two-dimensional surface. So these things, they all depend on two-dimensional coordinates, and that's why you only have different differentials with respect to these two derivatives, uh, two directions. So A, B are, I, I wouldn't call them internal. They are actually, uh, I mean, the thing where the dynamic takes place, I mean, namely on the world sheet. Okay. So this is uh, the, the Polyakov action. It has many nice properties, but also you see in some sense, it's just a dx squared kind of kinetic term. And the way I've written it, there's not much more. So this means the equations of motion that you get when you take this action and you vary it, they are very simple. So it's just a free free evolution for x, which so I've written is, here. Is it representing kind of something massless? Yeah, exactly. So there's no mass term here. There's no uh, there's no other coupling in what I've included here. It's yeah. just a free massless uh, so free massless scalar field on this two dimensional world sheet. Okay. A, a collection of free massless scalar fields. Sure. And uh, so, yeah, so there's no mass term here. So you just have uh, three equations. And also, um, I might have not emphasized this on the previous slide. I take the sigma, and this is uh, very common in this uh, field. I take it to be big rotated. So it's a purely Euclidean space. So I've, I haven't written the wave operator here, but I've written a Laplace operator. So this is just really a two dimensional Euclidean Laplace operator on this two-dimensional space sigma. And the equation that you get when you vary with respect to x here is just that the Laplacian of x has to be zero, which is sometimes called, uh, I mean, not sometimes, so this is called the studying the set of harmonic maps on the space on the world sheet sigma. And uh, this is one of the reasons why, I mean, string theory is very good for studying topological properties of surfaces and so on, or of spaces, because this is uh, related to, uh, harmonic maps are related to cohomology, to Betty de Ram and things like that. But this is not what I want to talk about. I should also say there is another equation that is, uh, that you get from this action, because it doesn't only depend on X, it also depends on the metric gamma that you put on the world sheet, sigma. If you vary with respect to that, you will get something which is like the two-dimensional Einstein equation. This is like the two-dimensional metric. And the corresponding equations are called the Virasoro constraints. So this is an additional set of constraints that you have to impose on top of this harmonic condition that I will not um, I mean it's it's extremely important for the theory, but I will not discuss it in any detail. So this is, uh, in some sense, the basic dynamics that you're dealing with, and now you want to compute scattering amplitudes in this. So for this, first you have to say what are states in this string theory. And states in this theory, or in string theory, are described by what is called a vertex operator on the world sheet. And um, you might have seen this before, so I'm just giving you some examples. In the closed bosonic, bosonic string, you could write down an operator which is e to the i k and then this field x on the world sheet. So it's something z here is a coordinate on the world sheet, x is this map that we saw on the previous slide, and k mu is just some uh, something that I need to absorb the Lorentz indices, and you can <clears throat> think of this as the space-time momentum. So mu is a space-time index and the colons indicate normal ordering. This is very common in uh, conformal field theory to have these vertex operators, and their property is that if you take the vacuum of the theory, this is an operator in the theory, you let it act on the vacuum, and for example, if you send z to zero, you will just get a state which is pure momentum state with momentum k. So this is what this operator here would generate. So in string theory, there are these tachyon states and bosonic string theory, and this is the corresponding operator that you write for them. And you can see they depend locally on where you put the field on the world sheet. Excuse me. Uh, is there also the angulomorphic part 
because in closed strings we have holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. Yeah, so, so here when I write z, I don't mean that this is a holomorphic function of z, so this depends indeed on z and z bar. Okay, thank you. And uh, But I think what you're more uh, uh, alluding to is when I go to the excited states, I mean I have dependence on z, which I write now just as a partial, or on z bar, which I write as a partial bar, so I can uh, excite both the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic aspects of x by writing things like dx and d bar x and uh, or if you write it in oscillator language maybe this is something that you're more familiar with uh, is alpha minus this would be an alpha minus one mu and alpha bar minus one mu for the left and right moving excitations of the string thank you and uh, th yeah thanks for the question and um the, uh, so when you write something like this, so this would be an excited straight in the closed bosonic string, you have to again absorb these Lorentz indices and this is done by putting in a tensor epsilon mu nu. So this is a space time tensor now. So is it a polarization type of thing? Exactly, so this is a polarization tensor. If you take the symmetric part of it, this will basically describe a graviton kind of excitation because this is a state now that has a momentum and a symmetric polarization. If you take the anti-symmetric part, you will get what is called the B field and the trace part is called the dilaton. Oh, so the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so, so, I mean, for any state in your string theory, you can write on a corresponding vertex operator. But like why you have scaled that, uh, scaled with alpha prime? Just to match oh. the dimension? Or yeah, something? so this is to, to match the dimensions. Uh, so you scale this with alpha prime because these fields um, X, they uh, carry a dimension. Uh -huh. And uh, here you see uh, there are two extra oh, X's. Okay. So you have to, so maybe I should first explain why they carry dimension. So K, you want to think of really as a momentum. So this is dimension full. Uh, so X has to have the opposite dimension of K. So um, this has a dimension. So this is dimension of momentum. This is dimension of one over momentum. True. And here, so you see if you, you have two dimensions and you want to absorb that. So this is why you have to divide by a length scale squared here. Perfect. Okay, indeed. So this is uh, what I just already said in words. So this K is like a space-time momentum and the epsilon you can think of as space-time polarization tensor of let's say a gravitational wave or any other excited state that you consider. And now once we have these things, so we have the states in the theory, um, what we want to compute is correlation functions. So this is again something that I'm sure is familiar from from quantum field theory, you have some um, operators in your theory and you just compute some correlation function. And here I've written down a path integral uh, form for that. So it's just that you integrate over all these maps or fields X, put in the, this Polyakov action and since it's Euclidean, it's E to the minus S. And then you put in the operators whose correlation function you want to compute. So this is the basic thing that you want to compute uh, to understand the way that the states interact with each other. And I should say, um, I mean, I'm not giving a full lecture on string theory here, that would take much more time. I'm glossing over a few details here that are related to ghosts. And I also want to talk about super strings, but I'm glossing over the fermions here just to make the, to give you the idea of what is involved. Okay, so here again, this is the thing that we want to compute. And how do you compute such a thing? We looked at this action before and we saw it was basically a collection of free scalar fields. And uh, you know, when you have scalar fields in field theory, you can do weak contractions to compute uh, their correlations. So the um, elementary thing is you have two of these fields. If you do a weak contraction, which I've drawn here, uh, you get a green function. And depending on the surface <clears throat> sigma that you're on, you get a different green function. So the, that depends really on the shape of this two-dimensional world sheet. So this is sort of the basic rule for how to contract these fields X. And now what is important is here is that uh, normally in field theory, we would compute, if we have a scalar field phi, you would compute correlations of fields phi, 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 or something like this. <clears throat> 
here I'm computing correlations of these vertex operators and they you should think of these vertex operators as composite operators. So these were the e to the i k x. So this is sort of where the uh, small complication comes in because it's not just um, you're computing correlators of free fields, but you're computing correlators of composite operators of free fields. What this means, for example, is if you want to <clears throat> compute what is um, sort of the, the product of two of these vertex operators where you just have e to the i k x, so you have two of them at different places, what you get from them is e to the greens function. So you see each x when you contract it gives you a green function. If you have e to the i k x, what you get is e to the greens function. And um, the case here, the momenta of the two states, so these were like tachyon states, they are turned into uh, products of these momenta, which is nothing but a Mandelstam variable. And this kind of factor, because this e to the i k x appears basically in every vertex operator, this kind of factor appears all over the place when you compute correlation functions in string theory. And it's called the Koba Nielsen factor. So when you have n of these operators, uh, you tend to see something that I will denote as Kn Koba Nielsen on the world sheet sigma, where you have all possible contractions. So i and j labels all the different pairs. Uh, green function going from one operator to the other operator, and it's uh, weighted by the corresponding Mandelstam variable. So this is. Um, a small complication that instead of having the usual axis, you have e to the i axis, and that's why you get these e to the green functions things. So these i j's are all possible type of contraction you have. Say again. These i j's are all possible type of contractions you have. Exactly. So here, so here you have n different. Uh, positions for these operators and you want to have uh, all possible contractions between all uh, the different operators. So i and j, I mean, because of symmetry, you only have to count whether i is bigger or smaller than j. So you choose one half and these are all the possible contractions between all the n different points. Um, as we also saw these operators, they don't, in general, they don't only have this exponential part, but there can also be some decoration in front with d axis. And um, what this will lead to is that instead of just having this Copa Nielsen factor in the correlation function, you will get also um, just from contracting the things that were outside the exponentials, you get green functions or differentials, derivatives of green functions. So this is the, uh, the correlator, which is the basic building block for constructing the scattering amplitude. And it depends really also on the surface that you're on because the green function depends on that and so on. So what you want to do now. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, can one extend this uh, construction to the case of strings that wind uh, a circle, for example, having the scattering uh, of strings that their wine? Yeah, so this is uh, captured. Uh, you can do that. It's a bit more complicated, but uh, I was writing down this Polyakov action where the target space was just flat Minkowski space. So if instead of flat Minkowski space, you take something like a torus where you, I mean, a target torus where you have a circle in this uh, space time target, uh, then you can also describe strings uh, where you have a winding excitation where the string winds around that. Okay, thank you. So the method is very similar. I, to be, I haven't, um, I mean, the, the way that this enters later on is th through certain Narine partition functions and things like that. Um, so this can also be treated. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Okay. Um, so this is the basic correlation function. It structurally looks like this. It involves the green function in many different ways. And it still depends oh, uh, on- Axel, just one clarification. So in general, this uh, like endpoint function, so you can actually factorize this Kn part and the rest of the part. So- Yeah, so this is uh, basically always a 
result. But, uh, when you this, I mean, th these contractions here will be punctures of the edge, or well, I shouldn't say oh. puncture, but this that I uh, are there in different ways. And I, you can factor this out, but uh, it's not like this correlation function will factorize into sub-correlation functions. Okay, okay. It's not really cluster decomposition kind of thing, if that's what you have in mind. Okay. So, still, so this is something that depends now where you put this vertex operator or the string state on the string world sheet and to get the scattering attitude. Uh, which, because of uh, diffeomorphism and variance, basically, you have to integrate over these positions that. So that means uh, this thing here is a function of these zi's, and you have to integrate over the position zi because it really, from geometric point of view of the word sheet, it doesn't really matter where you where you insert a string state. So this is one integral, and there's another integral that you have to. Do. You integrate over all the polyx gamma that you have on the string world sheet. So this I've written here as integrate over all possible world sheets, sigma, which means carrying out like a little integral over d gamma. So once you've done that, you can go from this correlation function to a scattering amplitude. Now, it turns out that, uh, I mean, this Polyakov action has many symmetries, particular it has conformal symmetry or also local wild symmetry. And um, when you have a very symmetric action, you have some kind of fixing of degrees of freedom or not degree, symmetries, fixed symmetries. So you want to quotient by three orbits to avoid overcounting. This is a topic, I mean, that is very understood. Um, and there are many concepts that go into that, like the conformal killing, Sometimes also called the mapping cloud, uh, things like the Rock theorem from Poly. The Fadir. Um, I'm not going to say this in full generality how you do this because you. This instead, what I will do is I get a few examples and tell you what it looks like. And so now I will um, the next. I will get a particular instance of this function and carry out these two steps for you to give you the scattering amplitude. And what I first will describe this is at <clears throat> tree level. Uh oh. Okay, uh, at tree level. So there is, um, and I will do this for four gravitons, so a full correction to start with in type two or type two string. Tree level means uh, there is a hole in the surface by using a conformal transformation, you can map surface into a sphere and a zero, and there are four punctures on the sphere here. And the graviton means that at every puncture, I have a polarization that I will call epsilon i and the momentum that I will call. So the symmetry of the, um, of the path integral that you want to do, the case of this um, relates to the fact that the sphere has a conform killing group. So um, things that leave the metric invariant up to conform formulations and since conformal summation do not matter in string theory, you can allow for conformal killing vectors. Um, the conformal killing group is P as a complex number. And if I Hello. Diantha, you there?
yeah, so maybe the local internet here at the Institute um, maybe I'll just probably wait for him. So the last thing that I think is that uh, there is a conformal killing group. Have for so Axel, sorry, the thing is, uh, I think uh, because of the internet connection, uh, some portion I, we couldn't able to hear. So well, I think you just uh, mentioned uh, a little bit uh, like, um, can you please uh, mention this uh, about this, this slide again, if you don't mind? Hello. Hello. Um, which is PSL for the commons. Uh, what we do is you can take this fear, which is this thing, so and just punch one bit and do stereographic projection to a complex of numbers. This is where it takes it on Z3 and Z4 in the complex plane and add infinity, let's say, the numbers that are removed. And then you group PSL over the complex numbers to uh, so the three parameters of these four punctures to specific points at your liking. And the standard choice is to choose uh, three of them to be at zero, one, and infinity on this complex plane. And uh, there would be one more, you could think that more degree of for the sphere, namely the size of here. The theory is conformal, so there's an invariant rescale. You can get rid of this freedom related to the size. is the same as uh, I mean, doing things in two-dimensional electrodynamics. So the green function in that case is related to the logarithm of the distance. So uh, that I write here is z1 minus z2, which is the difference z1, 2. <coughs> so this is um, up to some factors that I'm ignoring here. This is basically what the green function on a two-dimensional flat Euclidean plane looks like. And since the sphere is a compact space, actually you have to be a bit more careful. Um, I will come back to that in a moment when I talk about one loop effects, but for the moment, let's just imagine what you need is the green function is the logarithm of the distance. Okay, so then um, that means that this Koba-Nielsen factor basically, which is e to the green function will give you the distance raised to some powers and these powers are determined by the Mandel's dumb variable. So this comes from the possible different contractions. And since I fixed three points to zero, one and infinity and the only remaining variable was z, I get the distance between z and the point zero. So this is just z and the distance between the point z and one. So this is just one minus z or z minus one raised to some powers related to the Mandel's dumb variables. Okay, and there's a shift here that you can also see that we didn't see in the general formula for this uh, Koba-Nielsen factor. And this comes from one of the things that I was glossing over, namely the contribution from fermions and ghosts. And in this case, this is all that happens. Um, in general, I mean, we would also expect to have more complicated integrants like involving Green's functions and so on. So this is all that you get from the Koba-Nielsen. And um, then in this case, uh, I mean, we are scattering gravitons, so they have polarizations. What happens with the polarization is that they completely factor out of the correlation function and just give you something that involves uh, four objects, the right r, mu, nu, rho, sigma. So there is one for every of the four particles. 
which involves the polarization epsilon with two tensors and two powers of momentum. And they are contracted in a certain way, which is typically just denoted by r to the fourth. And the way that the reason that I write it in this way is not completely coincidental because this you can think of as something like a linearization of the Einstein tensor. If you think of, uh, of the graviton as a gravitational wave, this would be like a bit like the Einstein, oh, sorry, Riemann tensor that you get from this gravitational wave. And the fact <clears throat> that you get these um, higher powers of R here is very closely related to the fact, coming back to the question that was asked in the beginning, um, how this talks to corrections to the Einstein equations or Einstein theory. So like when you compute it, it will appear just outside the integral. It mm -hmm. will not contribute uh, in the wall sheet part. So it, yeah, so it doesn't, uh, this thing here is sort of a universal factor, which has just this polarizations. I mean, it's a, in some sense a kinematical factor and this comes out of this integral over the punctures. It doesn't depend at all on the punctures. Okay. okay. And, um, okay, so then, mm, this is the thing we want to integrate. And this integral here over Z, this is something that you can do uh, in terms of gamma functions. So uh, this yeah. is the answer that you get. So I've reproduced the same factor out here up to some small ch changes here in terms of the momenta. So these are the Mandelstam variables. But um, the interesting part of the integral is really this quotient of gamma functions. and. Uh, if you have seen any course on string theory, you will have seen something very similar to this, which was at the beginning of string theory in the, in the Veneziano amplitude for the open string or Virasol Shapiro amplitude for the closed string. So this is basically the same factor that you get. And the Mandelstam variables here, so this is something that involves K1 and K2, they were defined in such a way that they became dimensionless which means they contain the factor of alpha primed or the string length. Now you can, uh, so the string length sets the energy scale of the string or the mass scale of the particles of the string theory. So you can do an expansion in alpha primed or alternatively in powers of the Mandelstam variables. And uh, we will do that on the next slide. So here, what I, I um, want to emphasize also just in, to comment more on the physics. So here the gamma function has many, many poles. And these poles, they correspond to uh, whenever in this four point diagram that you've drawn here, you're not exchanging a graviton state, but you're exchanging a different state of string theory, one of the massive states. So these poles here, whenever the gamma function has poles at all the negative integers, this corresponds to when one of these Mandelstam variables becomes an integer, and this is related exactly to where a massive excitation of the string is located. So these poles of these functions here correspond exactly to exchanging not just the graviton, but things that are not part of Einstein theory, but only of string theory, namely the massive string states. And this is really where these corrections come from. And you can make them more manifest by doing this alpha primed expansion. So here's the full formula that I showed you. And now you can do an expansion in low energies, or as I said, in alpha primed, or yet equivalently in terms of these Mandelstam variables. So you expand out these gamma functions here. Uh, what you get is a leading term, which is just where all the gammas are one. And then you get corrections to that. So the leading term, this is what you would compute using Einstein gravity. Okay. And these terms here, these are uh, exactly what string theory predicts, how the four point graviton scattering amplitude in string theory deviates from what you have in gravity. So you see, I mean, here, this is uh, everything here contains, uh, every S contains an alpha primed, so two dimensions. So this is uh, suppressed by three orders of the string scale. So the string scale is very small. These are tiny corrections, but still you can compute them explicitly from here. Yeah, so this string theory corrections, is, is it like, uh, like uh, so as you say that this one by S1, two S1, three S1, four, 
this is basically related to the Einstein gravity. Mm -hmm. But these corrections you can treat as the higher derivative terms in the action. That's right, exactly. So in terms of an effective uh, space-time action, you would describe them as the Einstein term, and these you would write as higher derivative corrections to the Einstein term. Okay. And they would be related to uh, yeah certain things also involving curvature tensors. So this isn't related to <clears throat> four powers of the curvature tensor, and this is related to because you have two more Mandelstam variables, which means four more uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. So this is related to four powers of the Riemann tensor plus four derivatives. So this is called the d to the four r to the four correction. This one here. Mm -hmm. So this is a very high dimensional operator from the point of view of effective space-time descriptions of string dynamics. Mm. But uh, they're completely calculable here just from this closed formula. Excuse me, if you were having uh, things with winding modes, uh, we will have something like a parenthesis as some sort of universal thing or this also will change? Um, so one thing that will change if you have, uh, as I say, if you have in your target space, you also have a torus where you can have winding of strings. Um, yeah. Then the integral, let me go back here. Um, well, well, maybe not. Uh, so the, the integral will also change because then you can have here also the exchange of uh, wound string states. So in general, you will also have an, uh, an expansion like this. But what will happen is that these functions here, they can start to depend, uh, maybe not at tree level, but when you go to higher loop corrections, they can depend also on the shape of uh, the torus, so on the size of the circle that you're mapping into in space time, or if it's this rectangular torus or a shear torus and things like that. Okay. Thank but you. you have something uh, similar. Okay. So uh, maybe a few comments here for people who want to orient themselves. So um, one thing that you can show is that um, this, if you do this expansion of the gamma function to all orders, one thing that you notice is that uh, only these zeta, so zeta three, I should have said this. So this is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at three. This is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at five. And uh, when you do this expansion in general, you only get uh, zeta, the zeta function evaluated at odd arguments. So these are called odd zeta values. Um, something that is also quite interesting for these tree level calculations. So we are doing a, a calculation on a sphere and it has been known since the eighties uh, due to this work by Kawai, Lebel and Tai, that in some sense you can take the sphere, you can cut it in the middle into two hemispheres, which you can turn into disks, and disks are related to open string scattering amplitudes. So there's a relation between open string scattering amplitudes and closed string scattering amplitudes at tree level, which you can also sort of do at the level of these formulas, but I'm not going to show you this. And this is related to something that has been very um, much researched in the last decade or so called the double copy formalism for gravitational amplitudes. It's related to this BCJ formalism and things like this. So this is something that you can also do at the level of these uh, tree level amplitudes very nicely. Another thing that maybe fewer of you will have heard about is that you can have yet another relation between open and closed string scattering at tree level, which is not so much this KLT relation, but which goes under the name single valued map. So this is yet another way of taking an open string scattering amplitude and uh, producing a closed string scattering amplitude. And this is also something that has been very uh, actively researched recently. And this is the point that I will come back to later. So I think this is um, what I wanted to say about this closed string uh, scattering amplitude. Now let's, uh, at tree level, now let's take a step a bit. Let's take a step back and um, look at this again from a more general perspective. So, um, what we have seen is that a scattering amplitude in string theory has this low energy expansion that I called alpha primed, and I've drawn it in this direction here. So, the formula with the many gamma functions this summarizes this whole 
line for tree level, but there's another expansion that you have for spring scattering amplitude, which is um, the perturbative expansion, which here in this picture means taking Riemann surfaces of higher and higher genus, which changes the way they're weighted with a string coupling. So this is um, a very well-known concept that you have these double expansions of scattering amplitudes. And Einstein gravity in some sense uh, sits mainly here and then you get all these alpha prime corrections to it or you can also have perturbative string corrections. This is the way that I've drawn it. This is for four points, for four gravitons. And of course, you could also add another axis to this where you change the number of points in your correlation function. And as long as you stay at tree level, there's also a lot known when you do this change here. Um, less is known at higher genus, but this will be now the main topic of the talk. So now what I want to do now, and this is also where some of the new stuff starts, this was really a review part so far. I will want to take the discussion that we just had, all the details, all the ingredients from tree level and move them up in this picture to uh, the next level, which means genus one surfaces. Before I do this, are there any questions? Any question, please ask. Well, it's also fine if, there's, if there are no questions. <laughs> but OK, so then I will move on. <clears throat> now, genus one. So the world sheet now is a torus. So this thing sigma is a two-dimensional torus um, that you can think of as just taking uh, one of these parallelograms and identifying opposite edges. So you do these sides together and these sides together, and you get a torus. And uh, this way of looking at it is actually quite convenient because it uh, tells you also you can think of the torus as taking the complex plane and uh, modding out a lattice. So you identify points that are related by integer shifts in one direction. So here, uh, this I've normalized to one, or uh, integer shifts in another direction. So this is a two-dimensional lattice on this plane. And if you take the quotient of the plane by this lattice, you end up with a torus. This is sort of the algebraic geometry point of view. Um, now it turns out that when you look at this lattice, uh, of course, which basis you choose for the lattice is more or less uh, up to you. So you can do basis changes on the lattice and these are um, related to transformations by a two by two integer matrix, which for example, instead of taking this basis of the lattice, you can take a basis where you take, uh, let's say this vector and this vector. And uh, really it's a, just a transformation on a two dimensional thing. So it's a two by two matrix and uh, the coefficients have to be integral. But this means that I should identify, if I want to talk about inequivalent tori, I have to identify all these um, different shapes of this rectangle or par parallelogram, where these values of tau are related by these changes of bases. So this is telling you that instead of having all possible tau, I have to uh, quotient by what this group does. And if you do this, then instead of having all possible tau on the complex surface or upper half plane, you only have to look at a certain inequivalent set. And this is called the fundamental domain F for the action of this group that is called the modular group acting on this parameter tau. So now um, this is already a dis uh, different situation compared to tree level. When we talked about the sphere, we said we can get rid of all the aspects of the sphere um, due to the symmetries of the action. But here we see we have to label different tori and they're labeled by this uh, slightly oddly shaped fundamental domain. And this is called uh, the space of tau, then it's called uh, the space of complex moduli of the torus. Okay, so this is one thing, uh, just in terms of what is the torus, we already see we have some more freedom at genus one, namely this parameter tau. Let's talk about putting operators on the torus. So we have to pick a point Z. 
which is somewhere on this uh, region. And this puncture Z, um, you can label, for example, using the coordinates U and V, where U and V are just a unit in the unit interval to label how far along you go along these two axes. And whenever you describe now functions of Z, so this is what the correlation function will be, in order for the function to be well-defined, it must respect the symmetries of the torus, which means it must be invariant under shifts of this lattice. And the formal way of saying this is that any function must be doubly periodic. So whenever I change the position of a puncture to the position plus integer multiples along one direction, so tau is this direction here, or along the other direction n, which is just this vector, uh, the function must remain unchanged. It must be invariant under this. Okay, so now let's uh, repeat the, all the steps that we did for the tree level amplitude. Let's repeat it for this torus. Um, the moduli space for these punctures, you can, let me go back one slide. So here you can see uh, what was the conformal killing group PSL2 over the complex numbers before, now it just corresponds to shifts in the complex plane because I can take this rectangle and just move it around anywhere in the complex plane. It doesn't make much of a difference, which means that here this position, if I only have one puncture, I can place it wherever I want on this thing. So this is called the translation invariance of the torus. And we can use this when we have many of these puncture z uh, to fix one puncture to one place that we like. And I will choose putting the first puncture at the origin. But all the remaining uh, punctures then we will need to integrate over them in the same way that we had this z integral before. So this is one thing and as I said for the torus we also need to integrate over the different inequivalent tori which means integrating over the different values of tau. Now this is the formula that you get from what I was just saying. You compute the correlation function of these operators on the surface sigma, which I now label with tau. Um, you use translation invariance to fix, for example, z1 to zero, but you have to integrate over all the, all the other punctures from two to n. So you have to move all of these punctures over the surface and integrate over that. And then finally, you have to integrate over all the inequivalent tori, which is just this integral over the fundamental domain. Okay, so this correlator, as I said, this has to be <clears throat> doubly periodic in all of its variables. When you do the integral over these punctures, what you end up with is a function that only depends on tau. And as a function of this tau, it must be invariant under the same kind of basis changes. So that means that when I take the action now of an element of this group SL2 or PSL2, I should have written uh, Z acting on this tau, the action is like this. And the function that you generate in this step, when you integrate over the punctures, this has to be invariant under this transformation. So this is called a modular invariant integrand, since this is called the modular group. And then in the next step, you integrate over the inequivalent tori, and then you get your amplitude. So we've broken up the problem of computing the scattering amplitude at genus one into these steps. So first we need to get the CFT correlator, then we have to integrate over the punctures, and finally we have to integrate over the tori. Let's start with the correlator. So the first thing that we need is, uh, again, the green function. Now, this is the Laplace equation. I've now written it in complex coordinates, dz, dz bar. Acting on this green function has to be a delta that I've now normalized explicitly. And I've also put in this thing that I didn't explain before, the background charge, um, which you want to put in because the torus is a compact manifold and you want to make sure that the integral over the, um, over the compact manifold vanishes on the right hand side. Since the delta function will just give you a minus pi, you have to compensate this by pi divided by the volume of the torus. And this is 
the volume of the torus is, I should have said this here, is the imaginary part of this parameter tau. So now this is the equation that you need to solve for the Greed's function. Um, since we're still on a two-dimensional plane, we know it has got something to do with logarithms. The local solution is the logarithm of the distance. Now, no, no, that... sure. Yeah. So, uh, means, means uh, won't in general the uh, CFT correlator after integrating over the torus, won't it in general be more the modular covariant? Because uh, primary uh, operators will have some weight under modular transformations. So, so um, yeah, in the if I understand correctly, you're asking whether this has to be invariant or, or can be covariant. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so the, I think the way that I've described it here, it will have to be invariant. I agree with you. I mean, you can also, and I will talk about this later, there can be things that have a certain modular transformation property. But uh, I mean, this uh, scattering amplitude at the end, it will have to, this is just a number, let's say, right? I mean, so, so the, and this is the modular invariant integral, modular invariant measure to integrate over the different tori. So the integrand also has to be modular invariant in order to produce a well-defined number. Yes, uh, so in the other case, there will be some additional factors of uh, C tau plus D raised to- In, in the transformation, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, um, so here we, we were in the process of constructing the Green's function on the torus. Uh, locally, in order to get a delta function, you just take uh, the logarithm of the distance, but it has to be doubly periodic. So that means you have to take this distant logarithm of the distance and you have to put this at every uh, lattice vertex, let's say. So you sum over the whole lattice, m tau plus n, uh, and you compute this thing here. So this turns out to be uh, almost the right answer. There are some things that are related to convergence. So you have to correct for that by taking out a Z independent infinite lattice sum where you leave out one point. And in order to account for this background charge, you also have to put in an additional term here. So you can see this is quadratic in Z. If you take two Z derivatives, you get basically pi over tau two. So this is where this term comes from. Um, this formula is intuitively easy to understand because it makes the double periodicity very transparent, but at the same time, it's not so useful to work with this formula. So this is the Green's function in position space. It's more convenient to go to momentum space and write it as a Fourier sum. So you do a uh, write it in terms of Fourier modes. Of, I mean, it's a doubly periodic function. You can expand it in both the, uh, in one direction and in the other directions that are called U and V before. If you do this, uh, the, it looks much simpler because it just becomes a sum over the lattice where you leave out the origin, the Fourier mode divided by um, the square of M tau plus N modulus, which is nothing but the discrete momentum on this compact space. So this is really like the usual propagator in field theory. It's one over P squared with a Fourier mode. Um, and this is the conversion from the momentum space propagator to the position space propagator. And there are some subtleties here again, <clears throat> or details that I'm not describing, but this is really the formula that, you, that I want you to uh, remember for some time. Namely, that uh, the propagator is just one of a p squared on this compact space. So, ex just just a clarification: Why this two pi by tau term came because of that volume factor? So, uh, which term? This term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this came. Um, so here I said this term I added because I want the total integral on the right hand side to be zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this term here it is quadratic in Z. So if I take two derivatives of Z, I will get this term here. Okay, so this is really one of a p squared uh, propagators or Green's function on this compact torus. So 
now to get this uh, this first step still, so the correlation function under control, um, we have to work this out. And this is something that has been done um, kindly enough in super string theory for four gravitons. And it turns out that this correlation function for four gravitons is in this case, nothing but the Coburn Nielsen factor multiplying this uh, certain contraction of kinematical data. So uh, as a reminder, this Coburn Nielsen factor is just the sum over all pairs, ordered pairs, and then the green function from one position to the other one. And the exponential of that with a Mandelstam variable. The fact that this comes out so simple is really a co coincidence because we're looking at a very simple process, namely the <clears throat> four graviton process. If you do this for other correlators, um, as I said before, in general, you will not only have this Coburn Nielsen factor, but things like Green's functions, derivatives of Green's functions, and you can find a discussion of these things in the literature. Now, so this is the first step. So I've given you the complete correlation function on the torus expressed in terms of the Green's function on the torus. The next step is now to integrate over uh, after fixing z1 to zero, integrating over the three remaining punctures. So we want to take this thing here and integrate it over these three punctures. And now this is the moment where the sad news happen. Before, the, uh, I could do this integral explicitly and we got this quotient of gamma functions. But here, there's no formula known that would appear on the right-hand side. And uh, that's a bit disappointing because tree level string scattering, let's say, was so nice and easy. And uh, if it wasn't for this formula, string theory wouldn't have developed, I would say. When you go to string one loop, uh, one doesn't really know what the full answer is here. So in English, uh, there is this expression to hit a snag when something like this happens. And uh, I looked up what a snag was because I didn't actually know it. And a snag means some kind of underwater obstacle. So for example, a, a dead tree or something in the water. So, um, and the expression comes from shipping when people were going around on boats and when you hit a snag and you wanted to go from A to B, you got stuck at this tree or at this obstacle, uh, you couldn't proceed or in the worst case, your ship sank. So this is where the expression came from and here we've hit a snag at this point. Fortunately, our boat is not sinking, um, so we can make ourselves free again. And the way to do this is to look uh, not at this full integral, but look at the effect of this integral in a low energy expansion, in an alpha primed expansion. So that's what we will do now. So let me call this I4, which is this integral, and we expand it in alpha primed, or in other words, in the Mandelstam variables. And the best way of doing this is using a graphical representation <clears throat> of the expansion. And uh, of course, these Gs, they are like propagators. So I will draw diagrams from one point to the other one using a straight line for a propagator. And um, so this will give us some graph, which describes uh, how the different things in this expansion arise. And then we integrate over the vertex positions. The integrals that you get from doing then the integrals over the vertex positions, these are the things that are called modular graph function in the beginning. And so now you see where the different words come from. So graph just means it comes from a graphical expansion of this exponential. And the modularity comes from the fact that we know once we integrate over all these sets, we get a function which is a function only of tau, and this function has to be a modular invariant function in the simplest setting. So this is uh, where the name <clears throat> modular graph function comes from. And let me comment also the way that we've defined this Green's function. It has the property, so this was related partly to the background charge. If you take a single Green's function integrated over the torus, you get zero. So when you draw these graphs, you must not concern yourself with drawing graphs where a single propagator ends in a vertex and nothing else happens. Because then the integral over that vertex position will make the whole object vanish. Now, 
this function i4, if you do <clears throat> this graphical expansion, um, this is what you get. So first there's nothing, so only, an, I mean, no propagator, so you get a one. Then you have a single propagator and it would look like this. But by the rule that I just said, we actually don't have to consider this. So this term vanishes. The first non-trivial term is when you have two propagators that are connecting two vertices in a closed loop. And you can do this for all of the four vertices. So there are some permutations of this diagram here. And also from the expansion, whenever you have a propagator between vertex i and j, you get an sij accompanying this. And then there can be some symmetry factors as well. At um, the third order in the expansion, you can have graph la graphs like this, but also many other terms. And the general thing that you will have is you have four punctures and you can connect, let's say one to two with L12 Green's functions, L13 uh, with, um, so one and three with L13 Green's functions and so on. And this would be a very general term in this expansion of this um, function here. And remember, the reason that we're looking at this expansion is because we can't compute I4 in closed form. So what we are now trying to do is we try to describe how each of these terms individually work out. This one I said was zero. Um, the first non-trivial one um, with this double propagator is called E2. This one here with three propagators in a polygon is called E3. And this uh, notation here comes from the fact <coughs> uh, that they are in fact well-known objects in the theory of modular forms, namely non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. And they are modular invariant. So they're not transforming with the C tau plus D or something like this. They're really modular invariant. And that's because they are non-holomorphic. And the non-holomorphic here is expressed by seeing that this is uh, modulus squared. So it depends on tau and on tau bar. It's not holomorphic. <clears throat> so um, how do you go from this picture here to such a formula? Let me do it for you in one example. So this picture here corresponds to two Green's functions connecting one and two. So you have a square of this Green's function z12. And you have to integrate over one of the positions because the other one you can fix to zero. Now, um, I told you the best way of thinking of these Green's functions is in terms of the Fourier presentation where you sum over one over p squareds in Fourier space. So if you do this here, there are two propagators, so two momenta, p1 and p2, and each has a Fourier mode. And now at this place here, the only um, occurrence of z is in this exponential, and you integrate over z. So this will just give you a delta function, p1 plus p2, which is nothing but momentum conservation in this Feynman diagram. And then um, you get p1 is equal to, or equal to minus p2, but it doesn't matter here. And the integral disappears, so you just have one over p to the fourth. So this is meant to be p1, like, oops, up, p1. And if you compare this formula with this formula, you see this is E2. And whenever you have a polygon like that, you have momentum conservation at each vertex and you will just get uh, one increase in the power here. So you get E2, E3, if you have a rectangle, you will have E4 and so on for polygons. So Axel, just to, uh, want to clarify this. Uh, for this diagram, I can understand why two g, uh, g squared came and why this d2, z2, but why this is divided by tau2? Um, here? Yeah. Ah, so this is um, related to, so these things always come together <clears throat> because this is the measure that you put on the surface. So this is, um, remember the torus uh, was this um, parallelogram. Mm -hmm. And the area of the parallelogram is tau 2. Oh, okay. And uh, so this is just the normalization so that if I don't put anything here, if I just put the number 1 to integrate over, the result is 1. So this is uh, just the integral over the torus normalized by the volume of the torus or by the area of the torus. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So this is always the natural integration measure when you integrate on the torus. Okay. Function. Now I get it. Okay. So here, um, for these ones, we could re-express these things easily in terms of these well-known objects. If we have a general term in the expansion that looks like this, the question is, how does this evaluate? And again, I mean, it's not so hard to uh, in perform the integration over the puncture because this is nothing but momentum conservation at each vertex. But that, then what you're left with is unlike here where you just have a sum over a single momentum raised to some power, you will get some nested lattice sum over the loop momenta. So in general, this diagram that you draw, I mean like here, it can have many loops and you have to uh, sum over all these loop momenta and they will be intertwined in a not so easy way. So this nested sum is hard to make sense of. So it's not clear in this form, what is the most general kind of function that you get here. And this is what I would call a general modular graph function. Let me give you an example of these nested sums. So if you go to uh, just two vertices connected by three propagators, you, after performing one, uh, after performing this integral over the vertex, you enforce momentum conservation. So there are only two independent momenta now, P1 and P2. And what you get is P1 squared plus P2 squared, let's say P1, P2, and then by momentum conservation, this one has to be minus P1 minus P2, which in the propagator, you can write like that. So now this is the kind of thing that you have to do. And this is really like when you were doing quantum field theory, multi-loop diagrams, um, what you would get, except for the fact now you have a sum and not an integral because the space is compact. But now we have this thing and we want to understand what kind of object this is. And now <clears throat> something that turns out to be true, but not really what you expected maybe, is that this sum here, which is like a two loop thing, a two loop sum, is the same as one of these um, one loop sums up to a constant, where the constant is given by zeta three in this case. And this was uh, shown <clears throat> first by Zagier. So it uh, required some inspired mathematician to realize that this double sum is the same as a single sum. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe a bit unexpected also because I said, uh, this is what you would get normally as a two loop diagram in field theory. And what I'm saying here is that the value of the two loop diagram is the same as the value of a certain one loop diagram up to some constants. And this shows you, uh, the reason why I'm showing you this is because this is an instance of an unexpected relation between modular graph functions. So here, this is one modular graph function, this is another one but it turns out they are not really independent. They're, a very, they're related in a very simple way. So if you want to make sense of a general modular graph function, certainly what you want to do is you want to understand the systematics of these relations. So what can we say about these systematics? There are similar examples that have been worked out uh, later. So there are <clears throat> here are a number of references for that. And, um, but there's no general way, I would say, to analyze these sums and these relations for an arbitrary graph like this, or in particular, what you also want to do is you want to have not four, but n punctures. So um, we've reformulated the problem a bit by going to this alpha prime expansion and these diagrams, but uh, we still haven't solved the problem. So in some sense, we're, we fit another snack. I didn't find another picture, so it looks like the same one, but it's actually a different one. So what do we do to get away from this problem? Um, let's change tactics. So what we do is instead of explicitly looking at these uh, lattice sums, which I'm mean, define them, we try to characterize the function indirectly. And when I say indirectly, I'm, I'm thinking of using a differential equation for saying what the modular graph function is. And this is also something that uh, some of you might have encountered in 
quantum field theory, sometimes instead of uh, trying to compute an integral, you just look at it as a function of its parameters, let's say the masses and momenta, and you try to uh, look at differential equations with respect to these parameters, and then this is sometimes enough to understand the Feynman diagram or integral. So this is also what I want to advertise here. Um, the differential equations, uh, now these are differential equations for modular graph functions, which means they will be differential equations in this parameter tau, which describes the torus. So this is not really something related to space time or anything like this, it's something related to the shape of the string world G. Mm. Here is an instance of a differential equation that is satisfied by these non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. So they have the property that they are eigenfunctions of what is called the modular Laplace operator, which I've written out here in terms of the real and imaginary part of tau. Uh, they are eigenfunctions of this modular Laplace operator with a certain eigenvalue that is related to the number of links in the polygon. So this is something that um, has been known for centuries almost. And um, now you, you want to find similar equations for other modular graph functions. So one equation that you can derive, and this was done in this paper first, I believe, is that this function that we saw on the previous slide also is an eigenfunction of this modular Laplace operator for a specific value here. But then taking this equation and looking at the known equation, you see if you put s equal to three, um, the, the operator becomes the same. So that means that this function here must be the same as E3 up to some constant. And constant here is the only option because you want uh, the whole thing to be modular invariant. And this constant you can fix by looking at the asymptotics. So this is where you could get the zeta three from. And in this way, you rederive the same relation between this function and this non-holomorphic Eisenstein series that I showed you before, just from differential equations and asymptotic behavior, which is not the way that uh, it was done originally by Zagier. He looked at the lattice sums, but here using the, these differential equations, uh, you can get there very quickly. The little problem here is that <clears throat> getting equations of this type is also something that is not always straightforward. So in particular, if you want to get like eigenvalue equations like this, uh, it's not, not easy and they don't always exist in a nice way. But there's a lot of work also in this direction. So um, the approach that we took, and this is the new work that I want to talk about, is uh, that we uh, didn't look at a single modular graph function, but we put them into a generating series. So instead of trying to work out these equations one function at a time for one graph at a time, we decided to look at a, a generating series that uh, in some sense contains all possible modular graph functions. And then we derive differential equations for this generating series. And by specializing uh, the generating series, you get the differential equations for the individual modular graph functions. And what is more important is you can also use this to deduce relations between modular graph functions. And I should say this uh, thing that we did here, this was in the context of the <clears throat> closed string, and it relied heavily on something that uh, Carlos Mafra and Oliver Schlotterer had done for the open string just before. Okay, so what are the building blocks for this generating series? Since ultimately we also want to cover the heterotic string, we slightly enlarge our set of building blocks, which means we not only look at uh, Green's functions connecting two vertices, and Green's functions, I recall for you, are basically up to Fourier modes sums one over p squared, which are the things that come up in Koba Nielsen or outside the Koba Nielsen. Um, but we also consider things where we treat the left and the right moving part. Uh, as a dependence separately. So this means that um, here you will have also Fourier sums where you not 
where you don't have uh, p modulus squared, but you just have p or p bar, so the holomorphic or anti-holomorphic, or we call it the chiral and anti-chiral part of the momentum separately. So this is something that you want to allow for, uh, for the heterotic string, for instance, but also when you have more complicated vertex operators than just Koba-Nielsen. And these things, going back to the question by Diptaka, uh, the fact that now we not only have modulus of p squared, but holomorphic or anti-holomorphic p, these will translate into uh, graphs that have a certain modular transformation property that is not invariant. So these give us more general things that are called modular graph forms compared to modular graph functions. Okay, so the, these Green's functions we can generate by expanding out Kuba Nielsen factors. So certainly this is something that will go into the generating series. Um, how do we generate these chiral and anti-chiral things? They come from expanding something that is called the Kronecker-Eisenstein series. And here I've just uh, defined it in a way which says that omega, which is the Kronecker-Eisenstein series, is a generating function for these sums f. So there's some parameter eta that is, doesn't have any physical significance. It's just a generating series parameter. If I exp power expand in eta, I generate the functions that I'm interested in. <clears throat> So this is just a way of packaging these different things that could go into uh, diagrams. And the point is that uh, both omega and also the Kuba nielsen factor, they have uh, very well-known differential uh, properties. So if I differentiate with, resp with respect to z, eta, or tau, I mean, there are differential equations that are known, and they also have well-known periodicity properties. So, <clears throat> The generating series that we defined is uh, this one here. So this looks a bit scary at first sight. Uh, let me try to unpack that a bit. This is at n points. So I wrote it directly in the most general form. And uh, you remember when we have n points, there's always one that I can fix. So there are generating series parameters called this vectorial eta. And uh, for the points two up to n, there is a parameter. So this is, this is like a generating series parameter of the generating series. Now the generating series contains an integral over the world sheet punctures, starting from two. There's the Koba nielsen factor, which will generate um, Green's functions. And then there are these capital omega Kronecker eisenstein series, these will generate the uh, functions that are called f a or f bar a if I take the complex conjugate. And now if I expand out the Koba nielsen factor or the omegas, I can put all the building blocks together in any way I like. And in order to have this really in any way I like, I also have to allow for different contractions between the different points. And these are parameterized here in terms of these permutations rho and sigma. So um, because in the way I've written it here, it's just a cyclic product, one, two, two, three, three, four, up to n minus one n, which means that I'm connecting the points in a very specific order. If I want to have arbitrary orders, I also have to allow for uh, these relabelings of the points, the permutations. And the object eta two, three, that at the n that appears here is nothing but the sum over these different etas. So I appreciate that this is a very, um, big formula. Um, what I want to get across here is that from this formula, if you expand the Koba nielsen factor in powers of s, and these things here in powers of eta or eta bar, what you will get is the most general modular graph form. And form really is because you no longer necessarily have the same power of p and p bar. Uh, that you can have for a diagram. So whatever diagram you draw and you decorate the edges by saying it's either a Green's function or it's one of these other um, FA or FA bar, this is what it will look like <clears throat> schematically. It's the sum over all the momenta, momentum conservation at each vertex and the powers of the momentum that flows through the graph. And uh, Axel, uh, this uh, overall prefactor tau minus tau bar to the power n minus one, you 
have added to make it modular invariant or for some other property? <clears throat> no, it's uh, so you uh, maybe this is what will come on the next uh, step. But so you see here, actually, I've treated uh, eta yeah. and eta bar undemocratically. So here yeah. there's the tau minus tau bar, which I've slotted in here, and there's this overall factor tau minus tau bar to the n. Mm -hmm. And indeed, these powers of tau minus tau bar, which are nothing but things proportional to tau 2, are put in for adjusting certain modular properties. So what I want is that if I expand okay. this out in etas, I want uh, the components to have specific modular properties, and that's why I put in these extra factors. So the, the whole thing, I mean, uh, this as a function of tau, it's not modular invariant. Yeah, I see. And uh, these will also make sure that the differential equations are also uh, work out properly. Indeed. So when you look at the papers, we first define something which doesn't have these tau bar, tau minus tau bar factors, which you can also define, uh, and we give differential equations for that. But if I put in these factors, the differential equations become easier. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Um, okay. So um, one comment is that here, I mean, this thing um, is uh, strongly believed, and we have arguments in favor of that, that you can describe all possible string theory one loop integrands by sums of this type. So in some sense, this thing here, expanded out in the right way, will give you all possible string integrands. And this is really the thing that we are after. We want to understand all these uh, string integrands. And here, yeah, that's what I remembered. So I have the comment that this slightly asymmetric choice with this tau minus tau bar is for fine tuning some of the modular properties and also simplifying the differential equation. Let me give you an example of how this looks. So this beast, eta, um, if you go to two points and you expand it out, let's say you go to order eta to the minus one, eta bar to the minus one in the expansion in these parameters, um, you get something that still has an alpha primed expansion because I haven't fixed what, uh, what Mandelstam power I take. So <clears throat> this is what it looks like. So you re recognize this E2, which I said was one of the specific modular graph functions, E3. There are some other modular graph functions that come out in this expansion and so on. So this, this kind of Y object, it really contains all the modular graph functions that we could ever hope to obtain. And if you go to a different power in eta, this is also something that I wanted to remark. Um, this, you get not the E function, which is modular invariant, but you get a differential of E, uh, which is called Nabla E, where Nabla is defined in this way here as a derivative with respect to tau. And this thing here uh, has different modular properties than the modular invariant E. So the, uh, but the fact that this comes out very nice is related to these tau minus tau bar factors that we saw on the previous slide. Now, <clears throat> as I said, uh, what we're interested in is to obtain a differential equation. And I'm not going to go through any of the details of the derivation, it's not that hard. Um, the differential equation that this thing satisfies as a function of tau is the derivative, first order derivative with respect to tau, is given by a certain operator acting on itself. So it's just d by d tau of y is some operator times y. And this operator is a matrix operator because you this sigma and rho, they are like matrix element labels, and this is just summing over the matrix element labels as a matrix multiplication. Now what this operator is, let's open it up a bit. It contains holomorphic Eisenstein series. So these are lattice sums where you not, don't have P modulus squared, but just P to some power. They are holomorphic as functions of tau. And they contain these things that I write as R, Epsilon, K. And these are interesting. Um, for the following reason, what are their properties? First of all, they're independent of tau. They are operators, matrix operators, because they have two labels um, acting on this generating function. And when this K, label K here, is bigger than four, they're just linear in the Mandelstam variables. 
and they are of homogeneous degree in this other generating function variable. When k is equal to zero, there are two different parts. One is linear in Mandelstam, and it's like one over eta squared, and the second derivative in eta, so both of them are like one over eta squared, which would be consistent with this. And then there's one term that mixes eta bar and eta. All the other things here, they are just holomorphic in eta. So, <clears throat> so these are operators that you can work out explicitly and they act on this function. And this is uh, what gives you the differential equation here. And working out the explicit form of these Rs, you can do by just uh, going through certain identities for eta and k and using properties of them called shuffle identities and related things. And I should also mention that uh, when you go through this calculation, a bit surprisingly, at some point, the Weierstrass function pops up, uh, Weierstrass p of eta. And if you expand that one out, this is where these holomorphic Eisenstein series come from. I also wish to emphasize that here you see there's one term with eta z uh, with epsilon zero that I've kept separate, and the other ones they start from uh, k equal to four. And they have slightly different properties, that's why I kept them separate here. Also, the operators have some different properties. Here is an explicit example of what these operators look like. I said they are just matrix operators, so there are two by two matrices in the case when n is equal to three. Um, epsilon zero is of the degree one over eta squared, linear in S. Then there are the derivatives with respect to the parameters eta. And uh, then there is this term which mixes eta and eta bar. And the higher ones, uh, they are just of homogeneous degree in eta and matrices in the Mandelstam variables. So they're, they're not too bad as operators and you can find the similar form for higher n uh, easily. I mean, we describe an algorithm for doing that. So these are now the operators that uh, appear in the equation d tau of y equal to operator times y. <clears throat> um, you might have wondered why I'm writing epsilon k instead of just saying uh, k or something like this. This epsilon k is because these operators, they are very closely related to things that have been studied in the literature before. And this, uh, what they're related to is called uh, derivation algebra as introduced by Tsunogai. It comes up in a number of different contexts. It comes up in the study of modular forms when you study cusp forms, it comes up when you study integrable systems, and it comes up also when you study multiple zeta values and iterated Eisenstein integrals. And that's a point that I might come back to later, which reminds me I should look at the time eventually. Okay. Um, so this is, um, so these things here, these epsilons, they are abstract uh, elements of an abstract algebra called the derivation algebra. And in this algebra, they satisfy relations. For example, if you take this epsilon zero, which has a certain sort of special rule, if you raise this to a certain power and act with it using the adjoint action on epsilon k, you get zero. So this power that you need for acting on epsilon k depends on k, but there's always a relation like this, but there are also more non-trivial relations, and these relations are very closely related to cusp forms, modular cusp forms. But for here, I think it suffices to know that uh, there is such an abstract algebra. This relation we will see again in a moment. And uh, now what is interesting is that these things that come out of our differential equation, and uh, the same was already observed in the open string, these operators, they satisfy exactly these relations. So that's why we use the same labeling epsilon k here, because they appear to be matrix operator representations of this algebra. And that's a very powerful tool that we can use uh, and that we will use. So I should say that this is something uh, that hasn't been checked to all k, but uh, I mean, it, and all n in particular. Um, but we checked uh, quite a number of cases, and for all these cases, the relations are satisfied. <clears throat> okay, 
this is the differential equation again that I mentioned two or three slides ago. So we have d tau of y is some operator acting on y. It's a first order differential equation in tau and you might want to think oh first order differential equations in tau or in a variable I know how to solve. I just take a line integral. And um, I mean here it's a bit nested and it's matrix like so maybe you want to take an iterated line integral. And this is called iterated integration over tau or Picard iteration. And uh, in principle, using this together with some boundary conditions, so you take a line integral from tau to some fixed reference point, and this point is taken to be typically I infinity called the cusp. Um, you might want to solve this equation. So this idea uh, is good. And what you get then, you have to integrate Remember the R's are independent of tau, so you have to integrate things which are these holomorphic Eisenstein series times powers of imaginary part of tau. If it weren't for the imaginary part, these are exactly things that have been studied in the literature and go by the name of iterated Eisenstein integrals. And uh, Brown has done a lot of beautiful work on this in the holomorphic context. So what we're now looking for is something where uh, you don't have tau, but you have the imaginary part of tau here. So this is okay, we have to do some generalization, but uh, there's something that is a bit more worrisome, which is this term, which is one over tau, imaginary part of tau squared. And um, it's maybe not completely obvious from just looking at it here, why this is so much worse than these things, but this negative power of tau two is really bad. And another problem that this equation has for realizing this iterated integration is that you have to define this boundary condition at the cusp. So there are two small uh, problems that they can be both overcome by doing a certain redefinition. So instead of taking the generating series y, I look at another generating series that is called y hat, where I just transform y using this operator epsilon zero. So epsilon zero is really a special element in this derivation algebra. <clears throat> so when I do this, let me go back for a second to the to this slide. So you see if I take d by d tau of what is written here, r doesn't depend on tau. And here I have uh, one over tau. If I take d by d tau, this goes into one over tau squared. So I have r of epsilon zero divided by tau squared. And the way that this is engineered is exactly to remove this term. So what you get then, this y hat satisfies now differential equation where there is no longer an epsilon zero term. Everything starts at four. And the price you have to pay is that now this operator here in the redefinition will come into the equation as well. This is the point where now this relation from the derivation algebra becomes useful because this conjugation here is something that you can work out in a closed form because the exponential terminates. It truncates at order k minus one. So you just have a sum from j equal to zero to k minus two of this adjoint action in here. And now this is a much nicer differential equation for this y hat because it doesn't have any negative powers of tau anymore. And also this epsilon zero operator is sort of tamed in here. The range of powers, this is exactly what would correspond to these holomorphic Eisenstein integrals. So this is good. And also these, this thing here can be given a nice boundary value. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, let's look at this formula for a second again. So now, we've have, now we have this d by d tau of y hat is some operator acting on y hat. And this you can solve now by iterated integration. And I'm show, going to show you now uh, the resulting formula. So the resulting formula is that y hat is expanded out in terms of uh, certain objects, ESV, and the value at the boundary or at the cusp. So these ESVs, um, they are the things that you, that you expect to get from iterated integration, which means that um, L here, which is called the depth, 
describes the number of integrations you do. You do. And uh, since it's an integral up to tau, what this means is if you differentiate with respect to tau, you have L integrations, but um, this is sort of the limit of the bound, uh, the, the integration domain. If you differentiate with respect to tau, you lose one integral. So the derivative of this thing up to depth L is related to the same thing up to depth L minus one. And what you get is uh, exactly the thing that you want to integrate over, namely the imaginary part of tau times this function g. And in order for this to solve the equation, you also have to prescribe that these objects here vanish at the cusp. And for comparison, <clears throat> um, here, this is really the imaginary part of tau. I mentioned before work on holomorphic iterated Eisenstein integrals. Uh, where you have just tau and not the imaginary part of tau in the integral. So here you see this is um, in some sense doing the inverse of this differential equation. You have something of depth L minus one. You have this integration kernel. You integrate it along a line and you get the object at depth L. And all these things together, they uh, ensure that if you put this back, this will solve the differential equation. So we formally completely solved or expressed the differential, uh, the, the generating series y hat in terms of these objects here and the value at the cusp. But uh, as you can maybe appreciate, I mean, this is a formal solution in the sense that uh, there's still some work to be done here. And in particular, one has to understand both this hollow or real analytic iterated integral and the boundary values to really read off what you want to know. So uh, I'm not sure um, in terms of time, maybe you can give me some indications, Ayantam, how I should do it. Um, how, how much uh, slides you have to finish? Uh, well, <clears throat> I probably have um five let's say three or four or five more slides yeah continue then it's no problem okay <clears throat> because i will skip some okay so this is uh, the formal solution and as i said we need to know what are these things uh and the complication is that here you have the imaginary part of tau and not tau so they're a bit more complicated uh, which means they're not just given by doing these iterated integrals over the imaginary part of tau, but you also have to make sure to have the right real, anal real analytic properties. And this is something you can fix by using the reality properties of this function y hat. And here I'm showing you, for example, what this looks like for a specific instance at depth two. So you see this uh, thing that I call this, uh, oh, I should have said this. So SV here stands for a single value. This is uh, what we aim for at the end. And I might come back to that why we use this. Um, so this um, real analytic iterated integral is given by the holomorphic iterated integral. It's complex conjugate, but then there are many bells and whistles that you have to do. So first of all, there's a product of something at depth one, which is, um, a real function, but then there are also other things and integration constants that you have to fix. But all of this you can fix by looking at the reality properties of Y. But the main reason why I'm showing this formula is to say that um, this change from tau to imaginary part of tau in this integral uh, or in this differential equation to be more precise is um, unfortunately quite some complication. It's something one can deal with, but it's making something that was a nice holomorphic object at this level into something that is much more involved. Okay. Um, remember we did this redefinition from Y to Y hat, uh, but what we wanted to solve for was Y. So we have to undo this redefinition. If you do this, you get also the solution for Y, which is now expressed in terms of, uh, again, the same initial values Y hat at the cusp some operators and now these things that are called were called ESV a moment ago are reorganized in a finite sort of reshuffling way which is written down here. I mean these things uh, look more scary than they are. I mean this is um, 
uh, very simple combinatorics. So this is just, you take the labels of these things, rearrange them a bit and sum them up with binomials. So this is um, the solution for the function generating series Y that we actually want to understand. Which means that the beta SV are more interesting objects than the BS, uh, sorry, than the beta SV are more interesting than the ESVs, these calligraphic E's, and also it turns out uh, that they, are, they have nicer properties. <clears throat> okay, um, I think this is maybe as much as I want to say about this general generating series and its differential equation and so on. Uh, let's take a step back because it probably was a lot of material um, and reconsider our original aim, which was to understand and analyze these things that come out of the string scattering calculation. Now, um, this modular graph function that we saw already some time ago, which is uh, with three propagators, this, I mean, as all modular graph functions, this appears at some place in this generating series. And the place where this appears is at a certain order in the eta expansion and at a certain order in the low energy expansion. So here, <clears throat> S12 cubed is um, related to the fact that there are three, gen three propagators. So this is um, where this function appears in this generating series. On the previous slide, I showed you what is the solution or what is the expression, I should say, for Y expressed in terms of these beta SVs. And you can also work that out at this order. And this is what you get from the solution to the differential equation for the generating series. This is uh, one of the mod uh, modular graph functions. Another one that we saw was this uh, triangle. This also comes up at a different place in the expansion of the generating series. So this is higher powers in ether, but lower order in Mandelstam variables. Um, you can again take the formal solution for Y, expand it out in terms of beta SVs and these uh, initial values, and this is what you get. So now clearly, um, I mean, uh, even without telling you what beta SV26, what this actually is as a function, you can see that you can take these expressions and eliminate beta 26. If you do this, you get just that this function is equal to this function plus this zeta 3. And as I want to emphasize here, I haven't really had to tell you what beta SV is. I mean, it just drops out of this calculation. So we can use this generating series, which is sort of the moderator between the modular graph function and these other objects uh, to immediately deduce relations between modular graph functions. So this shows you that this generating series and its formal solution in terms of these objects is a very powerful tool. I should also say, I mean, we know what these objects are from other considerations, but for this argument here, it doesn't really matter. So what we have done is we have uh, analyzed these kinds of expansions uh, on both sides for two and three point correlators up to weight 10, which uh, you can think of as up to uh, five propagators, let's say. Every propagator counts uh, weight two. And uh, this covers all the corresponding betas up to depth L and weight 10. So we have analyzed fairly exhaustively. There is a big ancillary file to the archive submission where you can look at all the things, uh, what this generating series is, what it does for modular graph functions and for these, let's, let me call them iterated integrals. One thing that I haven't really talked about much um, is, when you go back for a second, in the solution, we have the beta SVs and we have the initial values or the boundary values, I should properly say. Um, and these initial values or boundary values at the cusp when tau goes to I infinity is something that you also need to work out. The um, one way of thinking about them, which is intuitive, is when you take the limit where tau goes to this boundary point, something is happening to the world sheet torus. So what is happening to the world sheet torus is that uh, it grows a very thin uh, neck or maybe not neck, a handle 
And uh, this you can think of as just taking a sphere and you're attaching a very thin handle to it. So it looks like a sphere with two extra punctures. But spheres we know are related to tree level calculations. So what you can hope to do is to compute these boundary values, not by doing a one loop calculation, but doing a tree level or sphere calculation, but you increase the number of points in the correlator or punctures. And this is something that, um, I mean, is intuitive geometrically and it is, has been done for n equal to two. And uh, I should say that uh, higher point things are under investigation as we speak. This is one way of getting these boundary values. Other ways are using more conventional uh, modular graph form techniques by looking at what is called the Laurent polynomial. And also this is something you can do and we have done in particular, Jan Gerken has de developed a very powerful computer software for doing that. Um, and uh, this is another way of getting these things which are important for understanding the solutions. But many things can be just done by thinking about these beta SVs. As I said in the previous slide, writing things in terms of beta SVs, sometimes you can already get a lot of mileage. What is more important here is that by thinking about how many independent beta SVs there are, you can get an idea of what are the possible bases for modular graph forms. And um, up to weight 12, you can do this straightforwardly and you have to be a bit more careful because of these properties of the derivation algebra at some point. But uh, what you can do is you can just count and this is what you get from there. So I'm not... Um, going to explain this, I think, in any detail. What I, the only thing that I want to say is that here, this column here, depending on the, this is the modular weight, you can immediately read off from counting this beta SV thing, you see the numbers always line up. What is the possible space of independent modular graph functions? And uh, this tells you if you have one, some complicated um, graph or integrand, string integrand, uh, you can put it into a basis which has this many elements. And this is something that is very powerful. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to skip over that. And uh, instead summarize, because I've uh, given you a lot of information, I think. So what happened? So the uh, thing that I discussed was that we looked at the genus one scattering amplitudes in string theory. And we talked about the fact that there's no closed formula for them, but one has to look at the low energy or alpha primed expansion of the genus one amplitude. Uh, and the best way of organizing this or reinterpreting this is in terms of these modular graph forms or functions. But <clears throat> once you have done this, you're faced with a problem, uh, what is actually a good basis for these modular graph forms, which uh, if you're more conventionally minded in terms of Feynman diagrams, you can maybe relate to what are the master integrals. Now, um, how do you get these relations between these modular graph functions? One way of getting them, as I explained, was in terms of this generating series. And this is a very powerful because it summarizes all the information in one go. This is a very powerful method. Um, you can actually determine this completely by looking at its differential equation and uh, solving it by iterated integration and you get some kind of real analytic um, iterated integrals involving imaginary part of tau and holomorphic Eisenstein series. So once you have uh, this information, you can, there are many things that become easier, namely finding relations, counting objects, and uh, as I say, there is an ancillary file of the archive where you can see many things. In general, uh, something that we would like to understand better is this construction of the initial values. As I said, this is something that is in progress and the idea is to reduce it to tree level calculations. Um, and something else is um, understanding better the relation to what is called a single valued integration or a single valued map. So this is something that relates the open and the closed string as I said in the beginning. And if you want to have something even harder to think about, um, you can think about doing this for genus two or even higher genus. And there, here's a reference where there are some first steps. And I think with this, I should stop.
So <clears throat> we have to thank uh, Axel for giving a detailed and very nice talk. And uh, uh, we have to clap for him. Now uh, you guys can ask questions. Uh, so please ask, unmute yourself and ask any question that you want, want to ask Axel. Uh, hello, Axel. Yeah, I did uh, so, uh, Yeah, so uh, I was wondering, are there any nice asymptotic properties if you go for large powers of Pendleton variables for the modular graph forms? Or is it expected that there will be some simplification for large powers of uh, this S, S, I, J. Uh, so this is, yeah, so what you have in mind is like high energy scattering simplifications. Right. I don't think it's been looked at in this context. It's a good question. At least I'm not aware of um, uh, investigations of these sort of, yeah, regi limits or high energy limits. The thing that, yeah, I see. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to find a good example. So the thing that people uh, look at is um, typically what is more interesting is um, when you make the torus, when you did generate the limit, uh, the, the shape of the torus. So this is something, these are functions of the uh, tau variable and they look at limits when you send uh, tau to the cusp. So this generates some Laurent polynomials in this tau variable. But yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, somebody else knows, but I don't think this has, as far as I know, this has not been looked at this kind of uh, gross Mendel limit or so for, in terms of the Mandel stump variables. This is, I should say, something that you have to do at the level of the full amplitude. I mean, of course, here I was looking at things at, a, let's say, to a fixed order. Yes, yes. Of mm -hmm. uh, S, I mean, this is at a fixed order of S. I mean, there's not much uh, asymptotics you could do there, but maybe at the level of this Y function, this is something that you could consider actually. Okay, thank you. Any other question, please ask. Unmute yourself and ask to Axel. <clears throat> Any question? There is no one. Everybody have understood it. <laughs> <laughs> or they're scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if no question, so like, please at least unmute for giving a clap. So thank you, Axel, for giving such a nice talk and uh, it will be uploaded to YouTube channel that you know. Okay. So, yeah.